Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Um, welcome back. And this video might be uploaded in the afternoon, in the evening, or wherever you are, in whatever neck of the woods you might be, whether it's morning or evening, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Now, we are living in some very dangerous times, times in which we have to look at, we have to examine um, with all of the intellectual energy that we have, what's going on in the political realm. Now, yesterday I was struck, flabbergasted as it were, when I recognized that there was an assassination, an assassination attempt on the life of the former president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Now, I first saw that piece of information, that piece of news, on TikTok, and I thought that that was uh, fake news, right? It's nothing that is real. Somebody who is malicious is trying to spread disinformation. But then I went on YouTube, and then other people started sending me information on the assassination, and I realized that this was a veritable, it was a true occurrence, it was a true event, something that I never thought would have happened, particularly so early in the election uh, campaign period. But then again, President Trump, former president of the United States, he has had a very interesting sojourn with the political hierarchical structure in the United States. When he became president in 2016, we had a lot of information from the left-wing media that his presidency um, came about as a result of his um, affiliation, as it were, with and his relationship with Vladimir Putin, and that Vladimir Putin actually, you know, connived and allowed the president to win the election. He sort of altered the election results in the United States. I'm not sure how Vladimir Putin could do something like that, right, to the most, with the country that has the most powerful military um, apparatus in the history of humanity that you have that, even though we know that Russia has nuclear weapons, but I don't think Russia has that power to outgun and to outmaneuver the United States as far as electioneering is concerned, as far as election process is concerned, and that he could have altered, as it were, the election results in the United States favoring Donald Trump's victory. That was something that was interesting, but the media um, went along with it and they rode that news for some years until people realized that it was a lie. And throughout his presidency in 2016, from 2016 onward to his admission of office in 2020, the left-wing media have been giving us a lot of narrative, narrative against Donald Trump, that he is, you know, um, undemocratic, he's an authoritarian president, he's racist, and all of the epithets that you can ever use against your opponent or your rival. I have never seen a president in the history of the United States who um, has taken so much flack against the left-wing media, particularly, but even including after uh, the pandemic, he also took a lot of beatings from the right-wing media to like Fox News. Donald Trump has a lot of flaws, just like any other president in the United States or humanity at large, right? We are not perfect individuals and we have sometimes some, I would say, despicable flaws, flaws that people hate about us. Now, we know that Donald Trump likes to be seen, he likes to be heard, and he is a guy who is not going to give up, even though people might say to him that he should. And we saw in which, you know, he challenged the 2020 results of the election, which, democratically speaking, nothing is wrong with challenging election results, right? Because that is the whole demo part of the democratic process. So when he challenged the elections, then something, you know, that was something normal in the United States um, free world and the principles that the United States, you know, embraces. It's a part of those ideals, of those ideologies to challenge, right? Because that's a part of freedom, not the way in which it was done when we saw where there was an attack on the Capitol, right? Those acts should be condemned. But were those activities, 
fueled by Donald Trump? Were they organized by him? Did he organize uh, an insurrection as the left-wing media like to call it? Did he really do that? Was he at the helm of such an insurrection? We still don't know the full story. We just hear things coming from the left-wing mainstream media, which is their narrative, and they're free to dispense and to diffuse their narrative. The problem is, is when many people Many people in society believe what they are told in the media and they think that that is the reality, they think that is the truth. And we are being constantly bombarded that, you know, Donald Trump is this dictator and that, you know, America has to save its democracy away from Donald Trump. But when we think about Donald Trump, we can't just think about Donald Trump himself and isolate him away from his party. Remember now that Donald Trump has millions of followers, people who adore him, people who like him, and people who idolize him. Now, it is not my decision to say whether they're right or they're wrong. It's a free society and people are free to embrace and to follow whomever he or she wants to, to follow. And Donald Trump is a very popular politician in the United States. In fact, the Republican powers that be the establishment have always tried to unseat him and to send him away from the political um, landscape. But every time they try, he has always come out victorious because his base continues to see that something is amiss here. Why are they trying to um, block the president that the base actually desires to be president? Even though the establishment might not want it, but the establishment are the elites. Right. Remember that the establishment comprise the elite class. So the fact of the matter is that people are saying that they're resisting that sort of elite domination, that sort of elite manipulation. And they're saying that this is our guy, this is our president, and this is the guy that we want to be president. Somehow, it seems like Donald Trump is an enemy or is an existential threat, existential threat to U.S. democracy, as we have been told or we are being told by the media. And they're constantly, right, they're constantly, you know, telling us about this existential threat, who is Donald Trump. Now, how could one man at 78 years old be an existential threat? who has never been a military person. You know, he was not even, a, let us say he was a general. He was not even a general. He was not a military guy, right? Just a businessman. So Donald Trump cannot be an existential threat for a large military apparatus and base that the United States has. It's impossible for him to be an existential threat. It is possible for United States citizens also to be an existential threat. So who is this existential threat? Um, about which the United States is always talking. We don't know. Well, I should say I know. We know. We, should, we know that it is the industrial, the military industrial complex is the greatest industrial um, existential threat, I should say, not industrial. And um, maybe I should say one of the greatest existential threats, right? Because we also have the Vatican. The Vatican, in my opinion, is the greatest existential threat to the liberties of the United States, to the freedoms and liberties of the United States. But we are not told that. And it's, a it's interesting to note that the three most popular candidates right now in the United States running for the presidency, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and the independent guy there, Robert F. Kennedy, are all Roman Catholics, right? Because Donald Trump is just trained. And I want to think that Joe Biden, and RFK are Jesuit coadjutors, right? I want to think that way. They might not be Jesuits themselves, but might have been trained in the philosophy and the understanding of how to um, function as a Jesuit. So they, they might be wearing the uniform and be declared as a priest, as it were. But we know that these are particularly RFK and Joe Biden are devout Roman Catholics. So here we have three Roman Catholics vying for the office of the presidency of the United States, and we are now awash with all of this confusion in the United States. Confusion at its 
the greatest that I've ever seen, right? It is amazing to see what is happening and to see the level of conflicts and drama that we see in the United States. It's like a theater. And most of the act actions that we're seeing now, we don't know whether they are true or whether they are just games being played, the um, the theatrical, you know, actions. We don't know. It's just amazing. We can't say what is really going on, right? All we can do is to look at what we see and try to put things together. Now, the Garden newspaper opened up this um thing. There's a piece of article here that suggests Trump rally shooting comes amid rise in support for political violence. So this is what they're saying. Let me share my screen with you. So it means, therefore, that there is an uptick um, there is an environment right now for political violence. The environment is ripe for political violence in the United States, something that is not very good, right? That's not something that anybody or any country should really try to foster. So we have here a shooting at the Donald Trump rally in Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday comes the time of heightened support for political violence in the United States, including against Donald Trump. Right, so there's a, there's a heightened support. What's expression here for political violence? By whom? Is it is still unclear why the shooter fired the gunshots at Trump's rally or what political beliefs he holds? Trump is safe according to the Secret Service, but at least one rally attendee and the shooter were killed, according to reports. But the moment is sure to intensify an already fraught election year in which elected officials have faced an increasing number of threats and fear of violence. So this seems to be the, what, the beginning of Soros. This is not going to stop. It seems that this is just, we are just now seeing we're at the tip of the iceberg, as it were, or not yet at the tip. We are just there um, at the beginning stage. Now, we have a survey conducted in late June from the University of Chicago found that there is now more support for violence against strong 10% of American adults or 26 million people compared with violence in favor of Trump, 6.9% or 18 million people. Until January, the survey showed there was more support for violence in favor of Trump, right? And of the 26 million American adults who support violence to prevent Trump from re retaining the presidency or regaining the presidency, more than 30% own guns and almost 80% have access to internet organizational tools. So they're already blaming the guns and the internet organizational tools that might be used uh, against Trump, right? In terms of inflicting violence on Trump. So they're saying, so we have to be prepared for violence coming from the left in opposition to Trump's rule. So remember now that the right were the ones known to be the terrorists, right? Remember now that that is what they were saying early on, that the political right is an ex existential threat to democracy and to freedom. Now we're learning that it might now be the political left who might be the threat, the existential threat to freedoms and democracies. So we're not sure what is what. Right. So is it now that the political left is going to be targeted? We know that the political right has already been targeted. So now it seems like the the um, the guilt, the blame will now be laid at the feet of the political left. Now, this is what the BBC has to say. Let us look at the another story coming from another mainstream media, the British Broadcasting Corporation. And the article is entitled. Biden condemns sick attempt on Trump's life. President Joe Biden has condemned the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. So the media is suggesting that it was, in fact, an assassination attempt, calling on all Americans to denounce such sick violence. The U.S. president was quick to call for unity in the hours after a gunman shot Trump in the air, killed one member of the, group, the crowd, and injured two others at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. The gunman was shot dead by Secret Service agents. Now, this is something I find interesting. Why is it that all the time you have these alleged attackers or, you know, what should I say now, um, lone assassins of 
presidents, of U.S. presidents, that is, that you do not have them alive. Their lives are not spared to render their account, right? To render their narrative of the story. They've never been spared. Their lives have never been spared. Shouldn't now the Secret Service has been, you know, I think they should now be trained in the, in the sense in which they could, you know, shoot without killing, right? Particularly these lone assassins, right? Shouldn't they be able to shoot them, right? And for them to just remain alive so that they could be interviewed, and we could get their perspective because when they die, we can only hear what the officials or what official dom has to tell us. But are they really sometimes, are they always telling the truth? That is the question. Now, when we have Kevin Booth, who actually, who is the lone assassin of president, of former president of the United States, um, Abraham Lincoln. And then we had Lee Oswald Harvey, who apparently or allegedly also murdered assassinated President John F. Kennedy, and these two assassins died, right? So we don't know the full story. We can only accept and embrace what we are told by official dumb, right? Or through other means, but we need to hear from these sources. So I think that it's time for the Secret Services to be trained. When things like these happen, I know they have to move very swiftly, but they should be trained in a way in which they might shoot, but not to kill. I mean, if they kill, happens to, to kill, then I understand. But I think that is what should be happening right now. Even though he's a president of the, a former president, but the citizen, if we're at a free society, should be able to listen to even the assassin and to hear what his perspective is, right? We can't just listen to what they tell us and think that that is what is so. We know that there is a witness, uh, your uh, there was a white guy there in Pennsylvania. He was at the event and he suggested that there, he had noticed just three minutes before Trump came on the platform that there was somebody on top of one of the roofs of the buildings there. And he was sort of pointing to the Secret Service, sort of trying to garner their attention by saying, look, there's somebody on top of the roof. And he seems to have had a firearm, right? He had a firearm. That is what they witness was suggesting that they saw him, the person, the alleged lone assassin, they saw him with a firearm and that he was just a hundred, just probably a hundred, you know, um feet away from Trump. That's what he suggested. And the it seems to me that the Secret Services were not able to do anything, would they act on what the man was telling them, right? Uh, maybe he, he, well, he said that perhaps the Secret Services were not able to see him, but he was actually beckoning to them and, you know, sort of letting them know that something's a miscare. A man is on top of one of the roofs here and he seems to be pointing a gun and perhaps somebody is going to get hurt. And evidently the, the president was injured, right? He was shot in his, one of his heirs. So that is something interesting. And the question is, why didn't the Secret Services also not have all the roofs, all the buildings covered? When you have, and somebody said the place was very, it wasn't a big place, right? It was a relatively a modest a place of a modest size, right? So the Secret Service Services should have been able to cover all the buildings there and you should not have left even a building uncovered, right? Because anything can happen at those large events, even though the grounds were not huge, right? But it attracted a lot of people and anything can happen, even, even within small spaces when you have a huge number of people at such events like those of the president, right? And especially the fact that the president, the former president was there. Now, let's continue with what the BBC for the news is telling us and see what they, if we can gather any clues. Now, in a statement issued within an hour of the attack, Mr. Biden said there was no place in America for this. And this is what I, I don't like. Yes, there is no place for it. But the fact of the matter is that the United States is a violent country and it has a violent history. How many presidents have been assassinated? Right? We've had quite a number 
of presidents who have been assassinated. And the other day I was listening to a video um, by this you know, presenter on YouTube about the history of the Jesuits and the fact of you know, how many presidents might have been assassinated by some of these Jesuits. And the list was quite, not a huge list, of course, but, you know, um, I never thought for the life of me that it's a possibility. Now, I'm not saying that he was assassinated, but it's a possibility that George Washington, the first president of the United States, could also have been assassinated. I did not know that. I thought he died of natural causes or the natural cause. We must unite as one nation to condemn it. It's sick. It's sick, right? So that is what the president is suggesting. And we heard the same thing from um, Justin Trudeau, that it's a sick event um, or it makes him sick. And we see where the presidents and the prime ministers of the world are practically using the same words. And we wonder what's going on here. You know, what is really happening when we see presidents and prime ministers around the world condemning the act using practically the same expression, the same words. Possible, but I'm wondering how can people, all people, including people who speak other languages, be thinking the same way and using the same words, something which is a mishear. But again, I sometimes overthink. The attack came amid a febrile election race between the pair laden with personal insults and barbs over their records in office. Seeking to present a unified front, Mr. Biden said in televised comments from his home in Delaware that everybody must condemn the violent scenes in Butler. We cannot allow for this to be happening. This is what the president is saying, Joe Biden. We cannot be like this. We cannot condone this, he added. He said he was grateful to, to, to hear that he's safe and doing well and praying for him and his family and for all those at the rally. Jill Biden and I are grateful to the Secret Service for getting him to safety. So the President of the United States has expressed his condemnation of the act and he has suggested that he desires to have a unified America. And those are very good words coming from the president. Now, Democrats unite to condemn attack. President Biden's comments were echoed by his vice president, Kamala Harris, senior Democrats, including former presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also spoke out. Ms. Harris said in a statement that she was relieved Trump was not seriously injured in what she described as a senseless shooting. Violence, this is what Ms. Harris is suggesting, is saying, is reporting, violence such as this has no place in our nation. She added, we must all condemn this abhorrent act and do our part to ensure that it does not lead to more violence. But it has, it depends on what the media does. Because what is happening right now, make no bones about it. People's minds, including in the United States, are controlled. Their minds have been manipulated, even intelligent people. Right? You talk to people and they say that Trump is this and Trump is that. And I'm talking to people who will tell me that they do not like Trump and they hate him. And I'm saying to you, why do you hate the man? And they can't give a reason. I just don't know. I just hate him. He's racist, right? Do you know the man? How do you know that he's racist? And isn't the American system of government racist? People know that, whether it's left or right, that the American government is a racist government. It's built on that. The country was built and founded on racist ideologies, right? So what is new? Trump is just a symptom of what the system is. Right. So I cannot say for the life of me that and single out Trump as the lone racist president in America. <laughs> that is ridiculous. But people believe it because that is what they hear on MSNBC and the CNNs. Right. And all of the left wing media, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. Right. And the USA Today. That is what they're hearing. Even the Guardian newspaper in Great Britain and all of these major left-wing papers around the world have also joined in the Hallelujah Chorus of suggesting that Trump is a racist, he's authoritarian, and he's the greatest, greatest existential threat to democracy. I mean, all of these papers and these left-wing media outlets 
are reporting the same thing. Now, how can that be normal? How is it that journalists in other countries are not trying to look at Trump objectively and laying and trying to unmask the contours, the, 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 the bowels, as it were, of the military industrial complex, the US military industrial complex, and to look at its flaws and to suggest and to let people know that Trump is just a symptom of the problem. He is not the root cause of what is happening in America. In fact, some of the very people who you are adoring, like the Joe Bidens, had it not been for him and some of the policies that he also, and the laws that he implemented, you wouldn't have a Donald Trump, right? But we have to go back and study history to see how is it that Donald Trump came about and why is it that you have so uh, such ubiquitous anger, deep anger, uncontrollable anger among people who constitute the Trump base? Why is it? Why are these people angry? Why are they upset with the establishment? And why have they chosen Trump as their king? Because that's what he is. And by the way, what we're seeing now in the United States is not an election about issues and about policies. It is going to be an election about personalities. That's what it's going to be. And who has better mental acuity and who is more mentally fit and who is kinder and more decent and speaks the truth versus who's a liar, a pathological liar. And we have on we understand that Trump is this pathological liar. And all the others in Washington, Joe Biden and the Democrats, um, Kamala Harris, and all these people, they're truth sayers, right? While Trump is the pathological liar. He lies everything. Everything that he says is a lie. And if you read the history of Joe Biden and you study him very carefully, you'll understand that Joe Biden is a pathological liar and worse than Trump. You know, well... To have been in politics for so many years in Washington, D.C., for over 50 years, I don't see how you can be there and not be a pathological liar. You just have to be a pathological liar, particularly working in the Senate. And he was president of the Foreign um, Services Commi uh, is it Commission, whatever you call it in, in, in the Senate. So the fact of the matter is that he has to lie. That's a part of the job that he has been tasked with. Now, as one with, as one, no, I think that Nancy Pelosi is talking because she's, you know, she had a recent, well, not her, but her husband had a recent incident with uh, a criminal. As one whose family has been the victim of political violence, I know firsthand that political violence of any kind has no place in our society. I thank God that former President Trump is safe, Miss Pelosi wrote on X, which is former Twitter. And they gave us that. Now we also have both Mr. Clinton and Obama echo the comments saying violence had no place in politics and wishing Trump their prayers, right? So this is what the Clintons and the Obamas are suggesting or saying, right? They're saying that violence has no place in America's democracy. But I wonder if the presidents, the former presidents realize and if they remember that they too practice violence, right? When they, not maybe on American citizens, but and other countries of the world, right? They need to be reminded. President Obama and President Clinton need to be reminded that they were enablers and abettors of violence, coups in other countries that destabilized countries and killed foreign governments that they did not like, that the American establishment did not like. We understand that they were doing it on behalf of the American establishment because make no bones about it, the president is not your real leader. That is the one that the leader you're seeing, but he's not the real leader. And people are telling me that, you know, oh, Trump is, is going to win Joe Biden and stuff like that. I've been saying to you, in a free and democratic and transparent society, if things are continue are at the same rate in which Trump is, you know, leading um, Joe Biden, Joe Biden in his state of, you know, cognitive decline, then yes, it seems it seems logical that um, Trump 
would win Biden. That's from a logical perspective, if you have a decent law-abiding election process. But what we're seeing now, and not even before this incident, before the Trump's assassination attempt, we have been seeing where there's a lot of lawlessness in the American political um, landscape. You know, we, from 2016, with the with Hillary and her opponents in the Democratic Party, we saw where they favored Hillary Clinton. And she got the nomination and she lost the election. And even when she lost the election, she still was blaming it on Trump and Trump's machinations with the Russians, with Vladimir Putin, right? Um, fast forward to 2019, when we had Joe Biden, when he came on the scene and he wanted to be the nominee for the, the presumptive nominee uh, for the Democratic Party and his contenders like the uh, the one that was the, described as communist, what's his name again? Um, yeah, kind of remember his name right now, but he, the Jewish guy, and from from Vermont, I can't remember his name. But the fact of the matter is that he, Joe Biden, Joseph Biden, was given the nomination, right? Because they did not want the Vermont senator to be the contendee to be have been the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party. So, from a long time, we have seen where the Democratic Party um, has been playing a dirty game. And their, 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 their politics is not open and transparent. So when you see them doing that and they can steal the primaries and they do these things, they can also steal the elections, right? Because what is to stop them if they can steal primaries? What is to stop them from stealing general election, <laughs> right? How are you going to um, trust them. And there are people who still confide in them, even though they have done these things and they're letting them know that they have the power to do these things. They still confide in the political process that, yes, the Americans have a voice. Americans do not have a voice. If Americans had a voice, you would not have been having two old men bang for the office because there would be able challengers, able competitors to challenge them and to win, because there's no way that Joe Biden, for example, could be president or could be even attempting to be president if you were living in a normal, healthy democracy. No way. No way. And I wonder where is the mind? Where, you know, can't people think? What is so hard to think that Americans today in the 21st century, in 2024, do not have the voices that they think that they had. I mean, I don't know if you ever had voices anyway, perhaps in the early stages of the, the democracy. But I have said to you many, on many occasions that when the United States decided to become an empire in 1945, um, and it has its antecedents even before then, but it became a de facto. Then was a time before it only had imperial ambitions, but after 1945, its imperial ambitions came or became reality. And they were now the de facto, or at that time, they were one of the de facto global empires in the world because you know, we had the Soviet Union. But since then, the Soviet Union fell in 1991. And the United States is the lone superpower. And I heard Joseph Biden saying the other day, the indispensable nation. These are only euph euphemisms that they use when they talk about the indispensable nation, the lone superpower. It refers to an empire. Those words are just euphemism used so they can fool you up and you think that the United States is on a quest to diffuse and to spread democracy and freedom around the world when it's there to control and if it's controlling other nations, it's going to control its citizens. And it's already controlling its citizens. And when it controls other nations, the people in that or of those nations do not have a voice. Because their even their presidents or their prime ministers have to do what they are told. And if their presidents and prime ministers have to do what they're told, how do you think the citizens will have a voice? Right? How do you think the citizens will have a voice? I'm also suggesting that Joseph Biden's desire to stay in the race is because he's actually being supported by powerful sources. There's no way that an 81 demented leader, somebody who doesn't even know where he is, don't tell me about Obama running the, the show, or don't tell me about 
you know, his children, his family supporting him. There is no way that the family members, nor Joe Biden himself, nor Obama, could stand up to a huge military apparatus and have Joe Biden remain in position and have Joe Biden challenge the core of the democratic process. Remember now we're saying that Joe Biden does not, did not want any contender, any major competitor to challenge his bid for the presidency. And some people are saying, wow, yeah, because he is the incumbent. And yeah, but that's not true. He's an incumbent, yes, but the fact of the matter, if it is a democratic process and Americans desire another president, then they should have their voices be heard and their voices should not only be heard, but should also be recognized. But right now, what we're seeing is that Americans can only talk. They can only talk on these, you know, um, social media platforms. That's the only voice they have right now. The only voice Americans have and people throughout our democratic realm and democratic world are through the major um, social media platforms. And when those platforms shall have been, you know, eradicated, be removed, then we are not going to have any voice at all. May I repeat that? The social media platforms like this one, and among others, that people use to air their grouses and read a lot of these YouTube comments and other social media comments, then you see people are expressing themselves because they cannot, their representatives in Congress are not listening to them and are not articulating the sentiments coming from the American people or from any people who live in so-called democratic countries. So what people have to do now, they have to use people like myself who post videos and if the people like it and they like the sentiments that they're sharing, then they will leave comments and they will they're able to express their, you know, their um their thinking, their thought processes. But don't say to me that the people in America have voice, right? They do not have a voice. They they do what the establishment wants them to do and wants their leader to do. And perhaps if the people of America want a voice, they would be a little bit more um, skeptical about the political process in the United States and begin to study, reading books to study how the American system is designed. Because as far as I'm concerned, it is a monarchy. It's not a hereditary monarchy in which the people, you know, the, the, the descent of the president, the line of presidency comes through the family. Right. It's really the presidents in America are chosen by a committee of wise men. You know, wise in capital W, wise uppercase W, right? Wise men. It's, that's what, you know, the people in America do not choose the president. And I think Americans should know, understand that by now, particularly after 2016, when Donald Trump won the election. And how did he come to the presidency? through the Electoral College, not through the popular vote. Hillary won the popular vote, but Donald Trump won her through um, the his um, domination of the Electoral College victory. Now, let's look at another. We have here on the USA, it's suggesting here, Trump wounded at rally in assassination attempt, gunman killed. So again, we see where the papers are indicating, and this is a U.S. paper, that this was an assassination attempt. This was an assassination attempt on a former president of the United States of America, something that is not a very good precedence, particularly as we approach the general elections. So we have former President Donald Trump survived a brazen assassination attempt Saturday evening as a 20-year-old gunman opened fire on a campaign rally, injuring Trump's right ear and killing a spectator, officials said. Trump was rushed off stage with blood dripping on his face after gunshots rang out at the rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, and the sniper, identified by the FBI as Thomas Matthew Crooks, of Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, was killed by Secret Service agents. Two spectators were in serious condition. 
Now, this brings me back as I talk about Sniper to 2003, or was it 2003, 2004? Or it could have been before, probably 2002, when we had the Sniper, the one that the, um, what was his name again, from Jamaica and, do, and his affiliation with a former uh, military guy in the United States, a former U.S. military um, soldier. Now, that was interesting, and then we later learned that they, you know, he seemed to have been connected with secret agents and his manipulation of the young man from Jamaica. And the fact that the young man who was then, um, I think he was Lee Boyle Malvo, right? I think that was his name. Um, he was a very young man, could have been when they met, you know, 16. And then by the time he got to the United States, because they first met in Antigua, and then they left Antigua and went to the United States and the guy controlled, controlled the young man's brains and his, his, his mind and allowed him to have killed a lot of people in the D.C. Virginia area. Something that was horrific round about that time. And we learned subsequently, particularly from the mother, that's Lee Boyd's, um, Lee Boyd Malvo's mother, uh, who stated that she had called the police and she had reported that this former soldier was controlling the mind of her son. And the authorities, authorities did nothing about it. Absolutely nothing. So we're wondering if this young man's mind was also controlled by somebody, by some agency we, you know, that we don't know about, to have carried out such a horrific action. Right? Did somebody control the mind? Did somebody train the person to do this? Because again, to really point at somebody, at a, at, a, at a former U.S. president, and have that tenacity, that audacity of climbing on top of a roof where you can be seen, because there are witnesses who said at least one who said that he was seen, and and the witness said that he saw him with a rifle. So it means, therefore, that he would have had to be trained to have carried out such a death guard, um, you know, action. He would have had to be trained. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Who trained him? That is a question that we will never know because he's now dead. He's now deceased. And there's no way that he's going to be alive to give his account of what took place. And then, again, if your mind is controlled, then people cannot, probably he's not conscious or he wouldn't have been conscious to give us the true story, an accurate version, as it were, of the story, if his mind had been controlled. Now, this evening, we had what we are calling an assassination attempt against our former president, Donald Trump. Kevin Rojek, FBI special agent in charge, said at late night press conference in Butler, the FBI has not released the motive in the attack. Trump said he was not, he was shot in the air, sorry, and an email sent out late Saturday night from his campaign team quoted him saying, I will never surrender. Hmm. Secret Service spokesman Anthony um, Buglimi said in a statement that crooks fired multiple shots toward the stage at approximately 6.15 p.m. So that was still a bright part of the afternoon because we are now in summer and 6.15 is very bright, you know. So it should be that people would have seen him crawling up to the on top of the roof of that building and pointing his rifle at the president. Crooks had been positioned on a rooftop more than 100 yards from the rally site. Now, what were the secret agents doing? Secret services agents or secret service agents, what were they doing? Shouldn't they have had all major buildings, particularly those so close to the president, be guarded and protected? Because as we are told in the Guardian newspaper, the officials understood that the American political environment is ripe for political violence. That is what we have been told. So why weren't there protective measures put in place to have averted such an occurrence? Now, Lieutenant or, or Lieutenant 
Colonel George Bivens of the Pennsylvania State Police said law enforcement is following up on a number of suspicious occurrences, including accounts from witnesses who said they tried to flag police about the activity of a person outside the rally moments before the shooting. So there were people who saw it and they were alerting the police. It seems that the police did not do anything um, to allay the fears or to leave the affairs of what the people thought could have happened. Because give his base the credit, they do not trust official dumb, and they are very protective of Trump. So anything that they see that looks suspicious, they would report. I'm even surprised that they didn't scream at Trump to say, you know, fall down or whatever. Because when they saw that, you know, that could have led, because people have been saying, you know, without any proof, we should say that it's a possibility that Trump's life could be endangered, particularly as we saw how the left-wing media have been treating him and the the, 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 the trials that they've had, his um, to impeachment. You know, it just has been a lot of drama in the media about Trump. Whether some of the things are true, some might be again. We just don't know. But we, what we do know, what we're seeing, is that there have been a lot of attempts to prevent him from sitting in the office of the presidency. My view is that Trump will never be president again. That is what I think, you know, unless he submits to the desires of the establishment. I don't think that they want him to become president again because trump is erratic and they might he might submit but then again when he enters the presidency he might not fulfill what they ask him to do and i think that is their greatest fear the establishment's greatest fear so trump could tomorrow say well i'll do that he'll comply with the wishes of the establishment of the elite class but then when he goes into office i don't think they trust him enough to carry out what to carry out their agenda Right, because Trump wants to to show that he's in control, and when you are occupying that position of power, even though it's a position of power, and we know that it is a tremendous position of power, but the fact of the matter is that we he needs to understand that there are also hierarchies higher than that power system, and that he has to listen to. But Trump is not prepared to listen because he just believes that that is where the buck stops. He believes that the office of the president, or he thinks, and he's right, that is where the buck should stop. But that is not the real world. That is not how it operates in Washington. The buck does not stop at the office of the presidency. There are there are other higher ranks. And Trump does not want to accept that reality. He wants to live in the reality that he's the president of the United States and the buck stops with him. And he had to have learned and um, you know, the lesson, I don't think he learned it. I don't think that he wants to learn it, but he learned it the hard way because he was, you know, booted, booted out of office, right? He was booted out of office. And I think he really yearns to go back to prove a point that, you know, he has that power and he can become a second term president, but will they allow him to become, an, uh, you know, will they give him another term? I don't think they will. And for those who of you think that you are going to bring back Trump into office, it's not, it, the system does not work that way, right? The system does not work that way. The establishment gets what they want. You might be able to change it, but until you change that system, you can't live in a delusional world thinking that the voices of the American people will be heard. It will never be heard. Not in the system, not in the current system that we have at the moment. And don't misunderstand me. I would love the system to change, but we have to first look at the flaws, the weaknesses, right? And, and the limitations of the system. And then we can attempt to change it. But the large majority of Americans do not understand the limitations, the flaws of the system. It is surprising, Roger said, when asked about the alleged gunman's close vicinity to the rally, he said the gunman's proximity is among the details that will come out 
in the investigation, Roderick added. The Secret Service really needs to answer that question. They conduct the initial site survey. Trump reached for his car as the gunfire erupted. Attendees at the rally began screaming as agents pushed Trump to the ground. Right? So we're happy that the president's life has not been snuffed out. So the FBI has identified Thomas Matthew Crooks, and he's only 20 of Bethel's Park, Pennsylvania, as the subject involved in the assassination attempt of former prime president Donald Trump on July 13th in Buffalo, Pennsylvania. The bureau said um, in a statement, I think they're saying, and they're saying here, this remains an active and ongoing investigation, and anyone with information that may assist with the investigation is encouraged to submit photos or videos online at fbi.gov uh, slash butler or call 1-800-CALL-FBI, right? An interesting sort. But the question is that many right-wing people particularly do not trust any of these three-letter organizations, right? <laughs> they don't trust the FBI, the CIA, and all these you know, organization, these secret services, they are not, they don't find them to be trustworthy organizations. And I can't trust them. I can't, I can't um, blame them for, for, you know, not putting their trust and confidence in organizations that the FBI, the CIA, because if you read the history and you see what they're doing, how can you trust them? How can we trust their investigation when they're connected with the military industrial complex, you know, I don't think we can trust them. And that is something that we have to understand. Now, there is an article here on political Trump's raised fist will make history and define his candidacy. Let's look at this briefly before we end the video. <clears throat> something that I found interesting. Now, what I find interesting, I must say, you know, let me get my thoughts together. Sometimes I'm talking and I'm wondering, what am I saying? But let me just get my trend of thought together before I lose them, right? Um, so the article is titled, Trump's raised fist. So we can see here, he's raising his fist, right? Will make history and define his candidacy. Now, the fact is, I'm, I've always been curious, right? How is it that Americans... American journalists can write these articles in short, you know, time, a short time span after the incident occurred. How can they do this? How is that? They, are they, you know, I know that you might have three journalists writing one article, but it's so, I mean, and the precision that they often write with, I'm not saying that it's the truth, but they write precisely and define, because to write a good piece requires time and you have to think. And especially what happened, but, you know, they were able to publish. And they, these things go up at 12 o'clock. I mean, even, uh, you know, sometimes before 12 a.m. Um, daily for its online readers. So we have here the apparent assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump on Saturday, outraged, electrified, and emboldened Republicans who, who hailed Trump's clenched fist in the wake of gunshots while it sobered Democrats who were already nervous about the threat of political violence and their diminished prospects this fall, right? It's interesting that Trump was able to raise that fist also. I mean, I'm sure that his heir, that's a very delicate part of our body. He should be in some bubble of pain. You know, what time do you have to think about you are not surrendering and the fight continues because that is what some of the journalists are suggesting. They're intimating that what he was saying to his audience is that the fight continues and luta continua. Uh, that is what he was beckoning to the people. He was saying to them that don't give up, the fight is on. Within minutes of the rifle fire at Trump's rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, Republican anger at the shooting turned to admiration at Trump's instinctive response and then jubilation at his defiance. So he, this is his, his instinctive response, even when he is injured to be defiant, a reaction that underscored the persecution his supporters feel and the instantaneous manner of how even the most grave news is processed. Now, 
By sundown and without concrete reporting about the deceased shooter's identity, Republicans were openly faulting their political opponents for the incident. We will not tolerate this attack from the left, said um, Representative Mike Kelly, who was president, who was president rather at the rally. So he's saying that already. I don't like that too when they begin to blame the other side because until the investigations are complete, I think that you know you should refuse from giving your opinion. And I think last night I respected that coming from the president, from President Joe Biden, when he's when the jurors asked him, who do you think might have been the perpetrator? And the president says, you know, I have my own opinions, but I refuse from expressing my opinions and wait until the facts are declared. I think that was very, very, a very irresponsible um, attitude by the president of the United States, Joe Biden. The accusation was as raw as it was remarkable. It evoked the 1963 assassination of President John F. Kennedy, which many Democrats immediately ascribed to the right-wing hostilities the then president confronted in Dallas, right? Remember now that the president went to Dallas to let them know that he was not going to do the bidding of the Pope. For those of you who do not know, that is what, that's why he went there. Right, because Dallas is a conservative, I understand, um, um, you know, constituent or constituency, I should say, right? It's a it's a it's a conservative constituency. And so he went there, uh, the president John F. Kennedy to Dallas to let them know that he's not going to do the bidding as a Catholic. He was not going to do the bidding of the Pope. Because as I've told you before, any Catholic president or any Catholic leader. Even Catholic citizens are subjects of the Roman pontiff. Recently, I learned that all Catholics, if you think, if you have identified yourself as a Catholic, you are really not a citizen of any of the countries that you live in. You're really subjects because the Pope is a monarchy. And the Pope does not regard any president or prime minister as superior to the position it occupies. So you are directly under the Roman pontiff, the rulership and the leadership of the Roman pontiff, even though you might live in Jamaica or you may live in Trinidad or you may live in Barbados or the United States, it does not matter, right? Your first allegiance is to the Pope of Rome as the reigning monarch, right? Because he is above all laws and all um, kings and queens, you know? So that is what you have to understand. I think I lost something I wanted to share with you. Now, years ago, um, again, what's his name? Chalmers Johnson wrote to this book, Nemesis, right? And he wrote this book, Nemesis, um, The Last Days of the American Republic. And essentially, Nemesis is the god of revenge, right? That is what he's saying. I think it was a goddess or, yeah, it might have been a goddess or a god. But it is, and essentially, he says that Nemesis means that a nation reaps what it sows. And many Americans believe that what happened yesterday is something that is unusual to happen in democracies. But do you know that Americans have also toppled foreign governments and they were genuine democracies? And the United States government toppled them, right? Toppled these countries. Now, on page 19, He's saying here, and this is the under the, the, the title of the chapter, Militarism and the Breakdown of Constitutional Government. So once you have a country that practices militarism and imperialism as the United States does, it is going to result in the erosion of constitutional liberties. And that is why the people of, Jamaica, of, of the United States have lost their voice. Because they have not been alert to what is happening in the government and to what the U.S. is doing abroad. Many U.S. citizens think that it is normal to kill other people abroad uh, in the spread or the fusion of democracy, but it's not good for them to be killed in their own country. But I have news for you, because if you think that your leaders respect you, if you think that your lives are much more, you know, respectable than the lives of the people, 
I think that you're going to learn a very hard lesson. But, you know, um, Chambers is saying here, it should be noted that since 1947, while we have used our military, that is referring to the United States, while we have used our military power for political and military gain in a long list of countries, in no instance has democratic government come about as a direct result. So even though America is suggesting, right, and it's insisting that it is promoting freedom and democracy in other countries with the use of its military, it's not doing so. In fact, it always achieves the opposite. It always results in dictatorship and in the loss of democracy. So when the United States citizens hear them talking about democracy and Trump is the greatest existential threat to democracy, you've got to be careful. Because how is it that the Democrats are preserving or securing democracy when they would not even have allowed a primary, a democratically in, uh, held primary in which other persons who were interested in contending and competing against Joe Biden could have done so. They forbade that process. They blocked it. They wouldn't allow it. And they threatened anyone who would have dared challenge Joseph Biden for the presidency of the Democratic Party. And sometimes when I look at what they did, I am really wondering if they're playing a game here when they're telling us, oh, all of a sudden they don't want to see Donald, um, Joe Biden. They don't, they no longer desire him to be the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party. I really, really wonder if they are truthful or this is just a game at fomenting more confusion. The more confusion in the country, the more they can have. They can um, supplant the power of the people. They can actually arrest every, the, the power structures, all the power structures, and perhaps declare a military country. Because that's what they're lead it's leading to. Eventually, the United States will be a military country, not a democracy, not a republic. In some important democratic government, come up, oh, sorry, let me hear. In instance, uh, I am in some important cases, rather, on the other hand, democracy has developed in opposition to our interference. So when Americans are not interfering, that's when you have democracies in other countries. For example, after the collapse of the regime of the CIA installed Greek colonels in 1974, after the demise of the U.S. supported fascist dictatorships in Portugal, in 1974, and Spain in 1975, after the overthrow of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines in 1986, after the ouster of General Shundu Wang in South Korea in 1987, and after the ending of 38 years of martial law on the island of Taiwan in the year in the same year. The United States holds the unenviable record of having helped install and then supported such dictators such as the Shah of Iran, General Sokorto in Indonesia, Fulgencio Batista in Cuba, and Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua, Augusto Pinochet in Chile, and the Seas Seiko Mabutu in Congo or Zaire. Not to mention the series of American-backed militarists in South Vietnam, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia until we were finally expelled from Indochina. In addition, for decades, we ran one of the most extensive international terrorist operations in history against Cuba and Nicaragua because their struggles for national independence had produced outcomes that we did not like. Right? Now listen to what Chalmers is saying. I don't want to bore you with Chalmers because Chalmers is a political prophet, not a spiritual prophet, but he is in fact a political prophet, right? This was a sage man, a scholar, and that is what you have to understand. Now, before we I go on to this last comment, there is a statement I'm seeing where Chalmers is quoting from James Madison, 
right? Which I think he's the father. Is he not the father of the American Constitution, James Madison? I think he he is. I you know I, I sometimes I mix mix up James Madison with Alexander Hamilton. I think that James Madison was almost like the father. He was like the main author, as it were, of that Constitution. The father of the Constitution, as it were. You could correct me if I'm not right. Right? Sometimes I mix up these names. Now the classic statement of this threat by the military. Um, was by the chief author of the Constitution, right? And that's what he's saying. He was a chief author of the Constitution, James Madison. Now listen to what James Madison is saying. Of all the enemies, so he's not the right-wing people and the, what do you call it now, the Putin and the all the dictators of the world. Of all the enemies of true liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of armies. From these proceed debts and taxes, and armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. You can see now that we have debts, America is really indebted, right? Staxing its people to the max, and then what's gonna have? That is what's gonna bring about the domination of the few. In war, too, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. And we can see where the executive power of the United States has been extended. So it means, therefore, that the United States is becoming less, less democratic. So when you say Americans have voice, they have no voice. Because what do they have there is a king who tells them what how the show needs to be run. And remember now that you have people behind the king who tells the king, who tell the king rather, what to do and what not to do. So the Americans, you have no power. You've lost your power. You've lost your voice, as it were. How can you get back the voice? I don't know. You've got to sit down and discuss that, look back at history and see how you can arrest that sort of system. My opinion, my humble opinion, is that it can never be restored. Right? It has long passed because Americans too have not been alert. They are not conscious of what the government is doing in Washington. You think you're so patriotic that you think that your government is working in your best interest when over the years they have not been working in the interest of the American people. Right? So the industrial complex, the military industrial complex, has taken over and the people that operate it, and they are dominating. And there's nothing now that you can do because they have this large military apparatus and they have the technologies to control you and your behavior. Okay? Just trying to let you know. So, what is happening in Washington, whether it is Trump or it is Biden? The system remains the same. The system will remain intact. Unchanged is going to be unscathed. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and I say, when they say, oh, yeah, and, you know, let's be sorry, sympathetic toward Joseph Biden. Yeah, we, we can sympathize with them in terms of a human to human. So we, we sympathize with Trump based on the injury that he has sustained, because as a human being, you know, we would not like that to happen, not even to our greatest enemy. However, Trump is going to be okay. And if he had died, God forbid, his family would have been okay. It is you and your children who will have to live with the legacy of this military apparatus that he himself and other presidents have built up. Okay? Something that you have to understand. So, Trump is not going to save you from this military, mighty, humongous military apparatus. And that's what Americans have to understand. Neither is Joseph Biden. Okay, let me continue, shall I? Um, I always forget where I am now, so give me a moment. So yeah, it's influence in dealing with out offices, honors and emoluments is multiplied. And all the means of seducing the minds are added to those of subduing the force of the people, right? So the government can seduce your mind. And many Americans, their brains, their brains are not working. 
you can see that you, when they speak to you, you can understand that they have not got a clue of what is happening in their own country because their minds have been seduced, have been manipulated, particularly by the media. And the media have become so aggressive at doing that and they're not even hiding it. They're not even hiding it anymore. They are so partisan. They are so much despicable, repugnant, that I find it very even difficult to listen to anything coming from the American media. The same malignant aspect in republicanism may be traced in the inequality of fortunes and the opportunities of fraud going out of a state of war and in the degeneracy of manner and of morals engendered in both, right? So they don't care. No nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Let me repeat that. No nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. You cannot. You cannot have an empire and a democracy. The, the, both of them cannot cohere. They cannot cohabit the same space. How many times am I to say that? So when you tell me that, oh, Americans have voice. Okay, what voice do you have? You have none whatsoever. Thank God, the Constitution, there is a wall that protects you, um, which is the Constitution, from the tyranny that is about to happen in America. The problem is that over the years, the presidents and the military industrial complex, uh, they know that. So they are seeking right now to shred every principle of, enshrined in the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. When they shall have accomplished that momentous feat, then is when you are going to see the ire and the true emperor, the emperor without clothes. And it's not going to be a pretty sight. It is not going to be a pretty nudeness of the body, the nudity that they're going to look at when they shall have unmasked what is beneath the garment. It is going to horrify the large majority of Americans. Now, let us continue to listen to what James Madison is saying. War is, in fact, the true nurse of executive aggrandizement, right? So the fact that they're there war and killing people, it builds their ego and they think they're kings. So they are no longer your public servants. They are your kings because why? Others have to listen to what they tell them to do, right? So they fear the president. I am the president of the United States and with what I say, that is what you've got to do. And presidents and prime ministers in other countries, they know that. They're aware of that. They know that they have to fear the United States. They might respect her, but they know that they have to fear her because she can use her military to control them and to also to foment a coup against them and to boot them out of office, to kill them. Which in many cases in history has been done. Right? In that case, we have lots of examples to show in history in which the American military has actually booted and assassinated de facto legitimate presidents of other countries. In war, a physical force is to be created, and it is the executive will. And when we say executive, we mean the office of the presidency. It is the executive will which is to direct it. In war, the public treasuries are to be unlocked, and it is the executive hand which is to dispense them. Remember we said that, well, I shouldn't say remember we said that because that is true, that's the law of the land, that the president is also president of the people, and he is also the commander-in-chief of the military force. Right? He is commander-in-chief of the military forces in the United States. In war, the honors and emoluments of office are to be multiplied. Emoluments too, they get paid to do it. 
right? So they're not just getting their salary. Some of you think that they're just getting the 300,000 or whatever they earn per annum. Is it 400,000 now? I can't remember. Not Did not check it, did not update myself with it, right? But whatever they're earning, it's just a little check that they get. <laughs> but they earn other emoluments, right? Because remember that the military industrial complex is a complex. It's industrial, meaning that they earn money. It is for profit. Industries are connected to that military apparatus. It pays to kill. It pays to kill to shed blood. All right. In war, the honors and emoluments of office are to be multiplied, and it is the executive patronage under which they are to be enjoyed. And it is the executive brow they are to encircle. The strongest passions and the most dangerous weaknesses of the human breast, ambition, avarice, vanity, the honorable or venal love of fame, are in are all in conspiracy against the desire and duty of peace. So they don't want peace. They want war. So when we hear the presence of the United States suggesting that there's no place for violence in our democracy, what democracy are they talking about? What democracy are they talking about? And I would like to ask President Obama and also President Joseph Biden and the Kamala Harris's of the world, including the George W. Bush and any of other surviving American president. No, there is one. Well, they, I think he, has he died yet? I'm not sure he, well, I'm not suggesting that I want to hear him die, but um, Jimmy Carter, you know, that he is recently ill. He is he's way up there now, should be 100 years old. But any sitting American president who can hear me, right, I would like to ask them, what about the violence that America fomented in other countries and the coups that it undertook? that deposed and assassinated many foreign presidents and prime ministers and overturned, as it were, the democracies and the stabilities of these countries. Hmm? Have they, I don't know, do you think that they're also suffering from Alzheimer's or some form of dementia? Hmm? And when you read the history of the United States, and you look at the series of assassination of presidents of the United States, and you look at the Revolutionary War, the Civil War that was the bloodiest war ever in the history of the United States. Two sections of the country fighting against each other, North against, versus the South, against the South. And the violence that was included by the same people. Now, this wasn't an external, this was a civil war, meaning that it was a war that was fomented internally. Yes, we know that the Vatican has some hand in it, but if the United States people were united against the Vatican, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. Then you have Jim Crow, right? and all the sort of violence, violence after violence that you saw in the United States. And you're telling me that there is no place for political violence. Understanding the history of the United States that it was founded on violence, slavery. Horrific violence. Violence unspeakable. I remember reading a book, or some, some books with a friend of mine, and he was just, you know, when, he, when we were reading some of the experiences, the brutal experiences of the slaves and the manner in which they were treated by their slave masters, by their US slave masters and the slave drivers. The violence that was dispensed upon their bodies, that was inflicted upon their bodies. He had to say, Andrew, hold on, I have to get it together. Because it was so horrific that how can, just to even read it is nauseating. Can you imagine somebody inflicting that sort of brutality on another human being and does not feel any way about it. And just to read it 
and the mental imagery that it conjures up in one in one's mind, you you, you have. I mean, it, it it reeks a sense of nothing. You cannot really think or process that somebody could be so brutal and so beast-like, behaving like wild animals, wild animals in the wild. But this is how Americans behaved. And this is not a long time ago. This is not a long time ago. Remember, the Civil War was 1861 to 1865. So this is still recent history. Hmm? And we're talking about there's no space for political violence. It's not what should be had. And I don't think we want political violence. But we know that we are not living in paradise here, Barack Obama and and um, Clinton, Bill Clinton, we, we're not living in paradise. And the American society is violent and violence is profitable in the American society. Let me say that violence, Mr. Presidents, or Monsieur's Presidents, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, violence is profitable in the American society. Hollywood thrives on violence. And the American government in real life, this is not Hollywood now, in real life, the military industrial complex, complex thrives on violence. Yeah. So let's not be hypocritical here. Yeah. Let's not be hypocritical here. Let's face the real world and tell the true story. Well, let me end here with what Chalmers says here on page 19. On the title again, Militarism and the Breakdown of Constitutional Government. Right? And we're seeing now in America the breaking down, the breakdown rather, of the constitutional government. There is a breakdown, as right now as we speak, of constitutional government in the United States. The unintended result of this record of militarism is the contemporary Leviathan that dominates Washington, threatening our nation with bankruptcy, turning many of the organs of our free press into bravado like mouthpieces, and disgracing the nation by allowing our young men and women to torture prisoners picked up on various battlefields or even snatched from city streets in allied countries. In using the term militarism, I want to distinguish it from the defense of the country. No one questions the need to raise a citizen's army of the obligation of able-bodied men and women to serve in it in order to defend the nation and from foreign aggression. Right, to defend the nation from foreign aggression. You need some able-bodied men, as he's suggesting, to defend the nation from foreign aggression. But the wars listed above are virtually all ones that we entered by choice rather than out of necessity, right? Created the wars, manufactured the wars for profit, for economic profit, for political aggrandizement, right? And Americans have to wake up and understand that the goddess of Nemesis, and as Chalmers Johnson intimated, Nemesis is a god of revenge. And he's suggesting that a nation reaps what it sows. The pivotal question that I'd like to pose on this channel this morning, this afternoon, whenever it reaches you, is, is the United States beginning now to see the fruits of the seeds that planted, that this military industrial complex planted, the many coups that it fomented, that it engineered, that it manufactured in places like Haiti, in Chile, in Nicaragua, in Iran, in Iraq, just about anywhere. Extensive numbers of countries can tell you that, yeah, we were attacked by the United States. 
we suffered coups by the United States. And now the United States seems to be seeing a coup on its shores because we make no bones about it. If you have a president like the likes of Donald Trump, who represents a major political party, and from all indications, we cannot say that it's coming from the anger is coming from the political left, but there seems to be a coup. There seems to be someone, powers that be, who are against his um, candidacy for the presidency. They're in total agreement and they do not like it. And if they can get rid of him physically, I think that's the only way they can prevent him from gaining the presidency of, of the coming president another time. But I have news for these powers that be that it's God who sets up and he puts down. So we better be careful. We've got to be careful of what we wish and what we desire, including myself. I'm speaking to myself also. Because, you know, sometimes we have people who come to office that we might not particularly like and we might not share their ideologies and we might think they're cruel too. And I'm not saying that Donald Trump is. I'm just suggesting here that we must, after we've done all that we can do to diffuse truth and to educate the citizens about policies, then we have to leave, and we have voted, we have an exercise our franchise, then we've got to leave everything up in the hands of God. We just leave everything into his hands. Because at the end of the day, even though God gives man freedom of choice, but he will not allow man to do whatever he wants to do. Right? Because God runs the show. He's the God of the universe and he has to have some order. And even though our world because of sin lacks the order that heaven has, but God cannot live in disorder. He allows some of it to happen because of sin, but he's not going to allow men, mankind to behave recklessly that he annihilates, he destroys the will of the eternal. Right? So Americans, wake up. Wake up. It's time now to wake up and to smell the coffee, to understand that this is beyond Donald Trump. This is not about Donald Trump. This is about Joseph Biden. This is about an attack on your freedom and the fact that your voices are being suppressed, have been suppressed. And as I suggested earlier in the video, that the only voice you have right now is on social media. And that too is in danger of being suppressed. Right? So what, what's going to happen when everything is lost because right now even your political voices are lost. Whether it's Democrat or the Republican, the agenda remains the same. Right? The agenda remains the same. The question is, how can you change? And you know, Chambers Johnson is suggesting that maybe if you opt to become a direct democracy, things you might be able to bring about some change here and there. And remember, because America is not a direct democracy. You have checks and balances, but the checks and balances have been corrupted by the politicians. So when you think that there are checks and balances, there are none. There is really none. There's really none. Right? What you're seeing is a control of the entire political process. And the system now is suffering from st stage four cancer. Almost impossible to salvage it, right? So let's pray for Donald Trump. Let's pray for Joseph Biden. Let's pray for peace in America. And as the word suggests, I think it was written, the song was written by the same Pope Francis's, um, you know, mentor, whatever you want to call him, <laughs> you know, uh, Francis, is it Francis de Assis, um, let there be peace on earth. And let it begin, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let peace begin with me. 
the peace that was meant to be. Right. I shall not sing now because um my voice is hurt. But let us have peace begin with us. Right? We need the peace of God. And in spite of the politician that is in office, let's accept that that is the will of God for our lives. And let us support whatever president, um, in, irrespective of their personalities, irrespective of the fact that we might not share their ideologies, irrespective of the fact that they might be dictators, let's pray for them and ask that God will soften their hearts and will work upon them to do his will. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you in another video when I shall upload another one. Please remember to like and to share and to subscribe. Until then, ciao.